Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice. Today is a bit of a somber day here because it marks the fifth anniversary of the death of my mother-in-law, so Kirk's mother, Linda. And this video today is dedicated to her, to Linda. Now, for this, we are going to be taking a look at a song by Tool, actually two songs by Tool, from the album 10,000 Days. These songs were a tribute to Maynard's mother, Judith Marie, who had a lot of similarities to Linda. Linda, during the final two years of her life, was paralyzed and in a wheelchair due to a brain tumor. And Maynard's mother, similarly, was in a wheelchair and paralyzed due to a stroke for 10,000 days, about 27 years. So he wrote this song with her in mind, and it's clearly a very, very painful song, but also it's one that you can tell from the lyrics, which I previewed, um, that he really thinks of his mother as an angel. And I see that in Kirk. He thinks of his mother as an angel, really one of the best things in his life. So uh, it's going to be a little bit of a hard one to analyze, I think. We only have the version from the album, so we don't have a music video to go with it. I'll just be analyzing the lyrics and the music. Let's get to it. Just a quick note to all of you that are listening with me, uh, I really recommend you listen to this either in speakers that are on the sides or headphones that have some good panning. It's very clear that the whoosh, whoosh kind of sounds are one side and then the other and then one side and the other. And even this new sound that came along um, has a little bit of plucking in it. Uh, it's it's very clearly panned to the left. So it's, I think, probably a better experience in headphones, maybe even better than in a, a stereo system. So this first, um, the first notes that you're hearing from the guitar here, uh, when it first started playing, it almost sounded like it was like plucking along a chord. It was going so fast. And I liked the way it slowed down so that we became aware of all of the individual notes in it. And now it sounds like it's actually going to become one of the main themes or things to hold on to in this song. I like the evolution of that in particular. This kind of scene that Maynard's doing here, it really sounds to me like almost um, like a monk chant. Like I've, I've heard actually some monks in Tibet doing some of that, these droning chants, and it reminds me of that in style. Uh, and I think it's really pertinent to bring up here that Maynard's mother was devoutly religious. 
And uh, despite being paralyzed for 10,000 days, she just had this utmost faith in God and the unseen. And Maynard, on the other hand, was really frustrated and felt so much pain. And I found it difficult to understand that part of his mother. And uh, and I love these first few words. You believed you in belie- uh, you believed in movements none could see. You believed in me. And uh, Maynard's talked before about how she was just like a light in his life. So I think that the droning elements of this vocal choice probably was very intentional to evoke that spiritual element. Let's go back and listen to that one more time. I've had the chance to see Tool live in concert before. It was really amazing. I haven't heard this song before, um, partly because uh, Kirk skips it every time we're, or, well, he usually skips over it in the album because it's just too emotional for him. Again, one of the reasons why he requested this for today. I'm very, very close to his heart. Um, so this is my first time hearing this, but I have heard many other Tool songs. Uh, one of the things I love most about Tool is Danny Carey. And that was the big experience for me at the concert was watching Danny Carey play the drums and understanding the drums in a different way because of how he plays. I love the way that he really uses all of the different possible sounds of percussion. You know, it's fascinating to see how many different options he wants available in a live concert. And you hear him filling in different um, like almost like different frequencies here uh, with different choices that he has available in his kit. Man, I wonder how many pieces are available in the kit that he used for this recording. I'm sure it is a ton. If you know that answer, definitely post it down below. Um, I think it's fascinating hearing him do these fills. And sometimes I think that fills sound like they're a little bit spontaneous, but then I hear ways that they link together with a guitar. And that tells me that I'm guessing that they do have some sort of time signature in common at this point, but it's probably really subtle and I'm guessing it will evolve later so that maybe we can figure that out a little bit more. But there's some there's some, uh, some sort of basic meter or beat that's in common at this point that helps them sync up. I think it's very fascinating though to try and figure out what is happening uh, that's in common there. Let's go back a little bit. There's our first key change. Okay, so that was the moment we had our first shift, uh, big change. Uh, let's talk a little about, bit about the lyrics here. I, I didn't get them all partly because 
not because Maynard has bad pronunciation, he's he's quite good, um, but the way it's elongated sometimes doesn't follow a speech pattern as much. And I think this is very intentional, partly because the music that they create is very cerebral. It definitely uh, capitalizes on amazing rhythms. Um, so let's see, uh, I have the lyrics right here for us. Vacant, broken, fell at the hands of those movements that I wouldn't see because it was you who prayed for me, so what have I done to be a son to an angel? What have I done to be worthy? Ooh, okay, that got me. <laughs> um, and that's, I definitely feel like that's the way that Kirk feels. What have I done to be a son uh, to an angel? Oh, such a beautiful line. <laughs> okay, I think that speaks for itself. <sighs> I'm going to go back to that a little bit. By the way, if you hear background noise, it's raining. The skies are crying too. very interesting that the key change happens on the word worthy. That seems like it's implying that this is one of the biggest questions that Maynard has. Key changes are really big moments in music. Um, it is, it's important. Anytime we feel a key change, that entire song feels like a huge emotional shift has happened. So here, uh, it's very deliberate. I'm sure that they said, we're going to do this on the word worthy. What have I done to be worthy? of that kind of light, of that kind of love. Um, I think that uh, it it definitely sounds like it lifts a little bit at that point, um, which both makes it feel a little bit lighter and gives it um, a more sense of a question. So let me keep going. So time signature wise, even before we got to this big moment where we had a shift in a lot more sound, um, it was in something that had a subdivision of three. I think it was in a six eight probably, but it might've been a 12 eight. There's different reasons why you would write it in both of those, but they're very, very similar. So it's one of the things that's difficult to hear. It's like more like, how do you want to write it so that other people could play your music? Um, I do want to note that this is one of the slowest tool songs I think I've ever heard. Let's keep going. So again, talk about this, this tonal shift, right? It shifts just as we're going into daylight. Beautiful, almost word painting that is done with the instruments there. Daylight. Wow. I even like, like the, um, you have this that Danny Carey is creating a, a little roll at, that also gives a sense of opening up. It's beautiful.
the production of this is just fantastic. The way that things are mixed, there's so many different little sounds that they're bringing in here. Um, and they all sound clear and uh, almost palpable. It's really, really great music production. That's one of the things that I like when you can almost taste the way that the sounds feel. Um, that to me is like a, a sign of it being really crisp and great production. So I really love that here. Um, again, I'm also loving the spatialization mix that's happening. Um, I love hearing things. There are some things that just keep bouncing back and forth. So you, it's almost like a, it's almost hypnotic, really. And the also overall, the sounds in this section, they sound like you're coming to the end of times. So you have this really like a low bassier drum that hits in and uh, again like a drone on the bottom as well a very low note that's sustained and that makes it feel like it's settling back down but then there's this sometimes almost an emptiness in it despite all of the sounds that almost make it feel like a wasteland at the end of times um, the beginning of that section was daylight dims and then I'm gonna I'll come back to these lyrics in just a bit. I'll read you some more lyrics. Boop. at the end I think it is oh no there's another sound in there okay gonna talk briefly briefly about these lyrics um, and again about this time signature it's kind of returning to a similar thing they had at the beginning where it has this spaciousness in the time signature I imagine each of them is counting it like mad inside to try and stay in sync they're very good at maintaining different time signatures together so it's possible that they are in different ones um but i'm really impressed by how coherent it seems together at this point without having lots of sound to keep them together lyrics she never told a lie well might have told a lie but never lived one didn't have a life didn't have a life but surely saved one and whoo oh man that hits hard and you think about he, Maynard is talking about himself, but surely saved one that he's the person that his mother saved despite being 10,000 days paralyzed in a wheelchair. Oh, gosh. All right, let's go back just a little bit and catch the end. Some really fascinating bits of percussion there at the end. You know, there was a big boom, but then it almost sounded like there was like little taps or scratches in addition. Again, that's Danny Carey's really creative percussion. I, I've, I'm fascinated by what he does. Now we're going to be moving on to Wings for Marie part two. This is very curious to me because Tool typically does write long songs that have lots of acts in them. So I wonder why it wasn't just called Wings for Marie and included part one and part two. I don't know. Again, I haven't heard these before, so I'm not really sure if we're going to have a big shift. Um, but they've had big shifts in their songs before as well. If you guys know the answer to that, please post it below. I couldn't find one. But I am going to read you a quote before that talks about Maynard's experience with this song. So he said that he regretted pouring his private pain into the album. And this is his quote. I think probably the stupidest thing I could have done on 10,000 Days was put myself out there as much as I did with the tracks Wings for Marie Part 1 and 10,000 Days. I'll never make that mistake again. It just took too much out of me, too much emotionally, mentally, physically, all those manifestations. And technically, Wings is very difficult to pull off. If any one of us is off, it falls apart and makes that thing tragic. 
And that's not a good song for me to have to fall apart. It's just too personal. So uh, again, uh, I really, I feel very thankful that he did put this on the album uh, because I think it was able to reach people like Kirk and reach other people that have experienced similar pain. And I realize that must be incredibly difficult. I know the artists have a very, very tough time because in a lot of ways it magnifies the emotions that they're experiencing. Um, but uh, if you ever watch this video, thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Huh. There's a similar guitar pattern right there as there was in the first one. sounds really clear that there's a, a tempo shift that's happening in here. Um, I'll try and count it out for y'all. Let's see. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. It's hard to know exactly when uh, the big beats are gonna start, but I'm counting the uh, divisions of three. Um, so that would be how I'd basically say like, hey, this is probably going to have an eight on the bottom of the time signature. Um, usually if you have subdivisions of three, you have an eight on the bottom. And if it's subdivisions of four or subdivisions of two, you'll have a four on the bottom. Uh, unless you have triplets. That's when it gets a little extra confusing. But it sounded like the threes sped up at one point, so you had a faster tempo there. And... It might have just been 3-8, or they might have had various uh, combinations of like 9-8 and 12-8 in there as well. Not really sure, um, but definitely interesting. Oh, that was a cool sound. What was that sound? It's like... It sounded like I'm like stretching out or like taking your nail across a string, maybe. Oh, that was a cool sound. And even it even uh, went from left to right. It's like a frog string. Wow. There's, it really sounds to me like the instrumentalists are keeping a couple different time signatures right now. I still, the guitar, it sounds like it has that one, two, three thing going. But if you just listen, um, I think it's to like, uh, uh, um, I think it's to the hi-hat, but I might be wrong. Um, I hear a, a divided beat in two. So I'll see if I can point those out. One, two, one, two, one, and two, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and hit it. That's what I'm, I'm queuing into for a different time signature that's happening. But if you listen to the guitar in the background, it still is continuing a lot of the pattern that we initially heard. Whoa, it's neat. Hmm. 
There's a lot of sounds here that have to do with nature, like raining. Um, you might hear they're raining outside still, um, or you hear thunder sometimes as well. Uh, I think it's interesting that they're bringing these sounds in. I'm, I think that they were probably made in post, but I'm also kind of curious if they somehow uh, engineered them with something else. That's always interesting. And it sounded like a, almost like a bowed string here. Um, but that might just be a synthesizer. Let's talk about the words a little bit. Um, so this is 10,000 Days, Right Wings, Part 2. We listen to the tales and romanticize how we'd follow the path of the hero, boast about the day when the rivers overrun, how we rise to the height of our halo. So it's interesting. I feel like this one is getting a little more like a heroic tale, like epic tale kind of approach to it. And you feel that in in the buildup. The last one felt a lot more stagnant in a lot of ways. It had only, uh, I think, two key shifts in it, but it felt more centered around uh, stagnant harmonies the rest of the time. I guess this one is not really um, going in lots of different harmonic places, but the previous one had more emptiness in it, essentially. It, um, this one has build, um, a little more uh, percussion that's driving forward as well. So I feel like it's um, giving us a greater, like more of a tale to be related than a state of emotion necessarily. Let's keep going. definitely more drive. Um, Maynard's voice is being a little more active at this point. You hear more words that are spewing forth essentially um, at a faster tempo. Um, and it has a slow build. A lot of times that on um, like bowed string slash synthesizer, I'm not sure what it is. Um, it is working a, a lot in half steps, which tend to have a lot of tension. And sometimes it'll go down a little bit and then come back up to those half steps. So uh, those half steps make make us have a feeling of like drive this forward. Like we want to hear that resolution more and more. Um, so a bunch of things are working together right now to build tension and push this song forward. I just want to note a couple of lyrics here because I just realized that the one he ended on was Your Way Home. So I, I think that Maynard is really, in a lot of ways, wishing his mother a, a good journey after death. Um, but there are a couple of key lyrics that he went by that I just wanted to draw attention to. Um, but enough about, about the collective Judas. So there's a lot of references in these lyrics that are very religious. Again, I think that stems from his mother being uh, incredibly devout. Um, so, but enough about the collective Judas. Who could deny you were the one who illuminated your little piece of the divine? Uh, man, he loved his mother so much. You can really tell that he thought that she was the light of this earth. Um, and then he continues, and this little light of mine a gift you passed on to me 
I'm going to let it shine to guide you safely on your way, your way home. I found that really intriguing that he took lyrics from This Little Light of Mine, which is a very common song that you hear taught to children in church. And uh, it's interesting that he's taken that into his song and um, changed it as essentially like thanking his mother for being the light in his life. Uh, yeah, very, very curious, especially considering that he um, felt so much frustration, I think, at, and uh, just not understanding why his mother continually was so devout when she was stuck in a wheelchair and she was one of the best people he thought was on the planet, but somehow she he was just frustrated and thought, you know, why her? Why would she deserve to be paralyzed like this? Um, but she still was his light through it all. Anyhow, really beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, a lot more thunder now. Yeah, we're getting so much more sound now. I bet you the sound wave would just look like it got, it just was like this consistent crescendo getting louder and louder. Uh, I think this is the highest I've heard Maynard sing so far, I believe, in these two songs. Um, and uh, it's interesting. He says, what are you going to do when the lights go down without you to guide them all to Zion? And when I first read this, I was like, well, Zion? Like, that's a beautiful national park. Wow. That's like, I love the Red Rocks there. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. This is another religious reference. Again, he's really, he really hearkening back to that a lot. Um, Zion was another name for Jerusalem, essentially. Loved that section with many, many layerings of the vocals. Um, 10,000 days and the fire is long enough. You're going home. Whew, okay. Gotta keep going. A little teary eyed on that one. Okay, so uh, this is gorgeous. Um, wings for Marie, you know, obviously you think about angel wings, but it feels to me like this whole song has essentially been a buildup and a journey to um, maybe when she gets to heaven. And she's saying essentially like, I have, uh, I think Maynard's speaking for her. I don't know if this is actually her tone of voice, but um I've come home now, so that would be her uh, reaching there. Fetch me the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. Tell them their pillar of faith has ascended. It's time now, my time now. Give me, give me my wings. I love, love that, that idea of, okay, 
She's lived an awesome life. Now reward her. Uh, really, really beautiful. This is one of those moments when I think Danny is carrying on two different time signatures just within his drum kit. He does this. It's uh, He uses polyrhythmics a lot. Uh, listen to the kick. The kick of the drum is, seems like it's the sort of map for everybody to stick to. That's their foundation, rhythmically is the band. And listen to the things that he's doing, especially on the toms and the symbols uh, there, he has different, it sounds like he'll go into <sighs> just very strange groupings sometimes on the top, not strange bad, but like strange as in they feel a little foreign and we could really dig deep and figure out what those time signatures are. I'm not gonna do that uh, at this moment, but uh, maybe someday we'll really go into a tool video and just, analyze all the time signatures. <laughs> really great panning again on the drum pit. I think this would be a, a good time to talk about another meeting for 10,000 Days that I read about um, that Maynor has spoken about before. 10,000 Days is not only the amount of time that his mother was paralyzed and in a wheelchair, but it was also um, or is also the amount of time that Saturn takes to go around the sun, uh, which is really interesting because Saturn often represents change. Um, so 10,000 days and the change in Saturn could be about essentially a person evolving or um, moving on to the next part of life. So I think that it definitely represents uh, Judith Marie moving on to the next chapter, but it also probably represents Maynard and that change that he's undergone as well and moving on to the next chapter. And uh, often uh, since when you have that three underneath, uh, often that's associated with like boats or galloping, um, but the movement that 3-8 initiates, uh, all these subdivisions of 3 essentially, 3-8 um, again could be multiples like 6-8, 9-8, 12-8, um, will contain those within like bigger time signatures when you have that like fundamental division of 3. That's when it can be boats or galloping, or it can just be movement in general. So I think that this must have to also... Uh, be referencing the evolution of a person, of Saturn, of moving on to the next chapter.
love Maynard's vocals that have been kind of peppered into the background throughout here. Give me my, give me my wings. This line, you are the light and the way that they will only read about. Like, yep, that's accurate. I feel the emotion from Maynard and I, I hear the music too. So it's not just reading, but I am, I am reading about Judith Marie and the light that she was. Do a quick check on what's this, uh, what this, uh, Judith Marie unconditional one. So that's what he's holding out as the word one at this point. Uh, Judith Marie being his mother, of course. Um, really interesting section there had the most, um, activity, especially in the toms and the drum. It felt like the most aggressive. And that makes sense because his words were set as I am in my ways and my arrogance. And then he continues to go on after that. Uh, let's listen to that end of that section just a little bit more. No, back a little. Like they let his voice continue to echo in the background there, I think. Um, this is super reminiscent of the first one when I had that slide up into the word daylight. The the slide wasn't as continuous. It sounded like it kind of paused on various half steps as it was ascending. But it's the same words here. Daylight dims, leaving cold, cold fluorescence. Ah, that's a really interesting parallel to draw. Um, and it, it felt like it was returning to the feeling of the first track. So uh, I... I get that. That's, ah, I love that parallel. Listen to it one more time. Oops. There we go. Huh. Interesting doubling of the vocal there. Interesting. Uh, we have that same whoosh, whoosh, whoosh on panning here that was at the beginning of Wings for Marie Part 1. Um, definitely uh, a lot of callbacks. 
to the first uh, song at this point. I just, there is one line in here that hits me so hard. It's, I never lived a lie, never took a life, but surely saved one. And I just think about what an amazing example Judith Marie must have been. And I, I think about Kirk's mom and the loving life that uh, I understand that she lived and showed. So it's super, super beautiful and super emotional. <laughs> Go back and catch this end again. Oh, back a little more. ending sound there. Almost like it's like, beat me up, Scotty. Are those the sounds of wings beating? <sighs> I don't think I got that until the very end. I think that the whoosh, 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 I think that that was the sound of wings beating. And that's really awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, interesting. I spent the whole song not really knowing what that was. Ah, very, very, very cool ending. Um, Maynard's voice, of course. Uh, one of the great things about it is his pitch. He's really, really, really good with pitch. He's really good at keeping his consonants on pitch too. So when he changes sounds like different vowels or consonants, he just really continues to keep them right in line on that pitch. It's one of the things I find impressive about him. Um, but I also just find his writing and his expression really impressive. He's very, very dedicated to his craft and very dedicated to his mother. So ultimately today was all about mothers, about honoring mothers past. So um, I'm very, very, very thankful for you, Kirk. I'm very, very thankful for your mother, Linda. And I got nothing more to say on that. I hope all of you send some love to your mothers today and have a wonderful one. Thanks so much for joining us.